how do you think they could have possibly survived from antiquity? Uh, well, the uh, area is uh, covered up by sand dunes, and I believe that for a long time the uh, site was buried under the sand. Now, this case here has some metal objects in it. Uh, there are several pieces, and they look as though they're agricultural in implements. Uh, what sort of date is that? Uh, that would date in the uh, second century, and it's coming from a Nabataean uh, city in the middle of nowhere in the desert, where uh, we hardly believe that uh, agriculture was uh, practiced. And here is a piece of evidence uh, for uh, this activity. Uh, you have uh, axe heads, picks, you have a, uh, and a hoe, and uh, we have more evidence for uh, the agricultural activity. They are all made of iron. I believe that people could, at a time, grow and uh, be much more productive uh, when they really wanted to. And when you go down to the depressions, there is an accumulation of uh, clay. There are clay beds, and this is where they cultivated the, uh, the land. Now, at the bottom of the case, there's a very interesting display. It's uh, an iron chain which has broken away from what looks like um, the four prongs of a, a rake or a hoe. Is that also an agricultural implement? It was suggested this was an agricultural tool, but it is not. My hunch over this is, uh, judging by the illustrations on Assyrian reliefs, and this is Assyrian, it's coming from the Assyrian citadel at uh, Tsiklag, that uh, this was a grappling device for climbing over the uh, walls. If so, if I'm correct, then this is the first of its kind. Mm. But such a thing has never been discovered before. This is the first, the first one I know of. I would uh, be glad to, to, to know about more parallels to it, but I've plowed through uh, the literature and haven't found any so far. The Negev Desert adjoining the Sinai is another one of Professor Oren's Indian territories and accounts for about a third of Israel's total land area. Israeli military units withdrawing from Sinai are taking up new positions in the Negev and many sites of archaeological interest will become inaccessible for future study. The Negev hasn't been fully explored archaeologically and it's only in the past couple of months that a crash program to survey the desert in its entirety got underway. No one can give an estimate of what's out there to be discovered, but archaeologists in the past have found cities, settlements, and evidence of ancient farming. The prehistorians are very interested in this arid wilderness too. Men like Isaac Gilead, whose discovery of very early sites are setting him a number of questions. We talked together in his laboratory in Beersheba, surrounded by a large collection of stone tools, which prehistoric man must have made as he moved about the Negev. Uh, since Israel is a very small country, you can cross from one zone, which in our case is fertile, to another zone that is arid in, let's say, two or three hours of walk. The problem is why people that could live in the north moved to harsher conditions. Were they forced to move? Are these demographic pressures, population uh, explosions, or maybe people or some of the people found it's better and easier to live in the Negev. Maybe it's less rainy, you get less wet. As, as long as you can still maintain your standard of living, get your animals to hunt, get your vegetables to eat. So if you can live down in the south, uh, why not? Mm, but, I, but from what you say, it wasn't too bad. Okay, this is one of the problems we want to check. We want to know why. Uh, we deal here maybe with the more general aspects of archaeology or maybe anthropology. What, what are the cultural changes, what are the cultural processes that cause people to move to other directions, to other environments, why nearby the totally different environments. We can show now that the Negev was settled at least 100,000 years ago onwards. What was it that uh, created so much interest in the Negev? in view of the fact that there are so many more interesting sites, or on the face of it, more interesting sites in Israel? Uh, as we said before, one good reason is uh, the fact uh, that people lived in what was considered to be very difficult conditions, and the basic uh, problem was how did they live there? So archaeologists went out to the field to check how could hunters and gatherers live in such an environment. This was one reason. Another reason is that sites in the desert are preserved sometimes better than sites in the north. Here in the Negev, a group of hunters and gatherers can sit, let's say, for a day or two in a site, 
leave the remains the next morning, week or month, the site is totally covered without an artifact being moved. You can come after 50,000 years and expose the site the way it was deposited 50,000 years ago. Uh, if we look here, we can, uh, for example, see the, uh, a group of hand access. These are considered uh, to be very early. Uh, according to our chronology, these hand access are, uh, the professionals name them Upper Achillean, and the date is about uh, 100,000 years, years, uh, years ago. Uh, you can see here about 200 of these, uh, of these hand access, mm -hmm. and the typology, the type, falls well with what we know from other parts of the world, even from, even from Britain, that uh, uh, we can quite safely date them to the time range of 100 or 150,000 years old. Two stones over here that I wanted to ask you about, quite different from the other flints we've been looking at, uh, a different type of stone and, and uh, very much larger if they're stone implements, as indeed they look as though they might be. The professionals, the guys who deal with typology, call these choppers, core choppers, choppers or chopping tool. Mm -hmm. These tools, uh, we are not sure yet about the dating because the surface is fine, but these tools resemble very much the, uh, the tools found in East Africa in very early phases of human existence in sites like Oldova or other East African sites uh, where they are associated with early forms of men, early physical forms of men and uh, uh, we have similar sites here in Israel in northern parts of Israel in the northern parts of the Jordan Valley uh, we have also these choppers uh, it can be assumed that people from Eastern Africa uh, expanded moved and one of the best ways to move was to move through the uh, Syria African Rift Valley which is the place or nearby the place they if you can say originated so maybe they simply went north in the same rift valley with the same environment animals plants etc and this uh, this rift is uh, crossing also the Niger so maybe if we will try harder if we will make more systematic surveys in certain parts in the eastern parts of the Negev we may found also uh, evidence for earlier occupation of uh, early humans maybe half a million years old maybe even a million years old unfortunately these pieces that they look like very early pieces uh, if you find them, for example, in Oldova or in, uh, in uh, East uh, Lake Tukana and uh, places like this, it will be very easy. They go very well with, uh, with the Australopithecines or the Homo habilis, etc., etc. But the problem is that uh, sometimes you can find these tools in later industries. Since these tools are surface tools, are surface collections, we are, cannot uh, be sure if it comes from a real early or maybe it's a later. But the idea is that it's possible theoretically uh, to find them because people moved through the Negev from, in, ver in the very uh, early stages, moved through the Negev from East Africa to maybe Asia, Europe, the Near East, and uh, this happened for sure because we find these early sites north mm. to the Negev in the Jordan Valley near the Sea of Galilee. Finds being made by archaeologists in the desert impinge directly on projects to reclaim some of the land for farming. It would seem that archaeology has uncovered evidence of agriculture on a pretty big scale in certain parts. From Roman and Byzantine times, they found signs of vineyards and irrigation systems fed by large underground systems. Details like this are useful to Israel's Institute of Desert Research, whose director is Dr. Joel Schechter. Well, I think the most important factor is uh, that at least it shows us that it did exist at one time, at the time the desert was more productive. And uh, knowing this, uh, it gave us the confidence that we could uh, re-establish this productivity. I think this was the most important point. From what one hears from the archaeologists, this area supported a huge population with very large cities and an enormous amount of agriculture, including the growing of wine. Uh, did it surprise you that there was such an immense amount of agriculture of, uh, uh, of a, a wide-ranging nature and that, and that it supported such a large population when you first started working here? 
Well, I, I was a bit surprised. I would be careful about talking about huge cities. I don't believe that they were quite so huge as they, as they look when we see them today. We're seeing really the remnants of many generations of people within that city, many, uh, mm -hmm. and, and many times these cities were abandoned and resettled. Uh, I don't believe that, that we should exaggerate about the, the huge population or the huge productivity of the area. It is, after all, a desert and uh, not a fertile uh, not a fertile, productive, agriculturally productive area. Uh, we were surprised at it uh, after we learned of their use of water resources, their possibility of capturing floods, which are available in almost all deserts in the world. Perhaps one of the, one of the major things that we learned from um, uh, archaeology are the, is the change of climate over the last several thousands of years, over the period of time which this area has been inhabited. Now, archaeology has taught us that there has been no really basic climatic change in the last 5,000 years. However, within that 5,000 years, there have been shifts in climate which were exceedingly important for the people living in this area. For example, we know of many settlements which were at one time further south, which were abandoned for periods of several hundreds or of several thousands of years, in which time the population seemed to have gone north and new settlements were founded further north in the more rainy area. And then after a period of time, people have gone back to these settlements or have made new resettlements back further into the desert because the climate had changed and allowed them to occupy those areas. So here, archaeology gives us an excellent view of what the climatic changes have been like in this area over the past few hundreds or the past few thousands of years. For example, some very interesting work done on the level of the Dead Sea, uh, had, which is directly correlated with the amount of rainfall in this area, uh, have been very important in our knowledge of, of, uh, of the weather conditions, of the amount of rainfall in this area. Incidentally, it was also very important to the potash works there in knowing what they could expect as far as the level of the sea was concerned, because the Dead Sea levels are exceedingly important to them in determining where exactly they place their uh, evaporation pans for making the potash fertilizer from the Dead Sea. So here was a, uh, an incident where archaeology and the knowledge of climate in the past, over the past centuries, has been a vital, not only to our agricultural development, but also to an industrial firm that is producing a, a chemical fertilizer. So, uh, so this, this knowledge has been um, available to us through the work of the archaeologists and has been very important for developing this area. Archaeology in Israel showing that it has a role to play in solving some of the country's economic problems, at least. One comes away from Israel with the impression that archaeologically it must be one of the world's busiest places with a bold approach to a massive range of research and rescue projects. One that illustrates the spirit and confidence among Israeli archaeologists is a plan they hope to put to the Egyptians this year for a joint expedition and conservation program in the Sinai, now being returned to Egyptian rule. In Beersheba, they call it digging for peace.